Bonjour. Welcome to Watt Citizens Education Center's radio Zoom classes. This is SVN3E, Grade 11 Workplace Science, and I'm the teacher, Bronwyn Slate. If you'd like to participate live today, you're welcome to call the WASA studio at 1-800-465-7144 or 737-4017. You can listen on the radio at 91.9 FM or on the television at Bell Express U Channel 972. You're always welcome to join me live through the Zoom link, which is available from me, your teacher, and also your DEC. Our classes are scheduled on Monday through Thursday from 3 till 4 in the afternoon, and we are in our fifth week of our nine-week course. At this point, as we are at the halfway point of our course, you should definitely be submitting some work to mark for marking. So a reminder that the key questions are all the ones to submit for grading. They're listed at the end of each of your IL lesson. So in your IL package that you received from WASA, at the end of each lesson, there is a list of questions that refer to your uh, workbook that looks like the textbook that you can write in. So please do all of the questions. Some of them are check your understanding questions, but they're not all the check your understanding questions. So check, make sure you look at the list. Uh, some are activities and then there are review questions at the end of each chapter. So please show all of your work, including your steps and your thinking. Explain to me what it is that you're really meaning. Don't just give me one word answers, give me full thoughts and make sure you're answering the question opposed to just writing on the topic. Make sure you're actually answering the question. You can do it by hand or electronically. Either is completely fine. If you want to write in the workbook, you can. It is your workbook for, to keep. So it's yours. Uh, you can write in it, though the spaces are very small. So you might not have enough room to actually answer the questions well. But it's your call, depending on you know you're writing. Uh, if you're going to do it electronically, that is also fine. The files that are easiest for me to open are Word files and Google Doc files. Everyone has access to Google Doc through their NNEC email address. If you need help signing into that, let me know. If you're going to use a different file format, it's probably fine. But if you could just touch base with me so that I we can make sure that I can actually open your files. We don't want you to do a bunch of work and then I can't actually open your files. There are three methods for submitting your work. The first is to scan your work in and sign electronically. So if you've done it by hand, then you can scan it in through a smartphone. The iPhone Notes app has a scan function and the Android Google Drive app has a scan function. So you could do that and then send it to me. If you need to take pictures instead, that's fine. Those files are just a little bit bigger. So scanning them might be a little easier to send, but it's fine to send pictures as well. Then you can send it to me either through email to studentwork at nnec.on.ca and cc it to bronwyn.slate at nnec.on.ca, or you can send it through Facebook Messenger to be Slate Wasa. Second method to drop your work off in Sioux Lookout. We have an outdoor mailbox at our 74 front location. We're the bright red building next to the post office and we have a small white mailbox next to our side entrance. The third method is to hand it into your DEC. Your DEC can either send your work through the express or fax it to 807-737-1732 or toll free fax to 1-800-463-7852. If you'd like to connect with me through social media, both my Facebook and YouTube are under the name B Slate Wasa. So you can friend me there or subscribe to my YouTube channel, and then you'll get notifications every time I upload one of our lessons. All of our lessons are recorded, and then I upload them to YouTube and share that on Facebook. So it's a really easy way to access them if you want to watch the replay. All of our replays are in this called SVN3E. Uh, so that's the easiest way to find them. And there's also a supplementary video list there as well, which I link all of the YouTube videos that I have shared in class so that you can watch them from the original sources and get more information if you'd like. Science is really visual. I do my best to incorporate as many uh, visuals, images, diagrams, graphs as possible, as well as as many videos as I can, just because it rounds out our understanding. So tapping into the actual videos is going to set you up for the most success. If you can't join live through the Zoom link, that's fine. And if you can't 
watch the replays on YouTube. That's also fine. Uh, how you can get access to the videos is by letting me know and I can send you a copy of the recordings so that you still have that information. All right, if you have any questions or concerns, please contact me. My email address is bronwyn.slate, which is spelled B-R-O-N-W-Y-N dot S-L-A-T-E at N-N-E-C dot O-N dot C-A. My Facebook is bslatewasa. You can call me at the office at 807-737-1488, extension 2209. You can call toll free at 1-800-667-3703. I'm in the office Monday to Friday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., though I teach the first hour of the day and the last hour of my day. So that would be a great time to give me a call, but otherwise I'll answer my phone or you can leave a message for me outside that time and I will get back to you. I believe it's important to start our class with my positionality. I, your teacher, I have white settler ancestry. I have white privilege and this shapes how I understand things and how I walk in the world and therefore how I teach. So I acknowledge that and I'm working towards making sure I don't ignore the experiences of other folks and the knowledges of other folks as well. Um, our education system is probably pretty problematic in terms of it being fairly white centric. And I work towards disrupting that cycle within my courses. I live in Northwestern Ontario on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe people. And I'm constantly working to learn from this culture and integrate that into my work. However, this is my first time teaching this course, so I do have lots to learn and unlearn. It will be a lifelong process, but hopefully as I teach the course more frequently, I'll be able to integrate more other no more knowledges outside of my own and perspectives outside of my own as I go. Our textbook is also very Eurocentric. A lot of the examples and references are uh, white communities or uh, European white uh, scientists and things like that. So that is problematic as there are many other folks in our world who have contributed to environmental science and uh, the wealth of knowledge there. Also, there may be potentially problematic language. I haven't come across any, but there might be. Um, and if I, maybe I've missed something. So if anyone has noticed something, please let me know. Um, but I have noticed that it ignores Indigenous, Inuit, and Métis acknowledges and experiences. So that is also very problematic and something that I try to integrate into our course as much as I can in order to fill that gap. It's our last day on Unit 3, which is the environmental effects on humans. So, so far we've learned about factors in the environment that cause diseases in humans and what those diseases are. And then we've learned about vaccines and medicines and other ways to protect ourselves um, in our last session. And today we're gonna to be furthering that in terms of how we can protect ourselves beyond medication and protective gear, but through uh, cleanliness, so personal hygiene and household cleaners and making sure our environments, our classrooms, our workspaces, our homes are all clean. So this is lesson 12 and it's called personal hygiene and household cleaners. So our goal is that at the end of this lesson, you'll be able to describe proper hand washing techniques and safe handling practices. And you will understand the effects of contaminated air quality in homes and be able to suggest strategies of recovery. You know you've met the learning goals because you can practice proper hand washing techniques. You can explain how to safely handle food by implementing the clean, separate, cook, and chill method. You know the dangers of disregarding indoor air quality and the, the methods of prevention. So again, we've learned about medical and non-medical devices that can protect us from the harmful effects of environmental factors, but there are also low-tech ways of protecting yourself. So washing your hands and keeping food clean and your house clean may sound super simple to be of any use to fight those viruses and environmental contaminants, yet they are easy and effective ways of doing both. If you're doing these correctly, then they can make a big difference. So first we're gonna talk about washing your hands. So washing your hands reduces the spread of diseases. So frequent hand washing is the single most effective way to prevent infectious diseases of all kinds. Our hands spread about 80% of infectious diseases like the common cold or stomach flu. And viruses spread when contaminated objects or surfaces are touched by an infected per person and then by another person. Uh, and then people touch their mouths, their eyes or noses, and then we all get uh, 
contaminated and infected. However, these diseases caused by bacteria and viruses slide off your hands if you wash them properly. So it's a really effective way of making sure you don't get sick. We've got a lot of talk about washing hands in the last few years with COVID-19. So this probably isn't new for you, but it's good to cover over and over again every, uh, every once in a while. So first, when do you need to wash your hands? So before, after preparing meals and eating, after using the washroom, after helping someone else use the washroom, if you're supporting a toddler or a kid or doing diaper changes, things like that, um, still need to wash your hands. After handling pets, after blowing your nose or coughing and sneezing. So then, and I'm sure there's other times, and anytime that your hands just look dirty, those are good times to wash your hands as well. Um, so how do you actually do it that's effective? So use soap and water, do it for at least 20 seconds, get between your fingers, under your nails, and the back of your hands. Don't forget your thumb and dry your hands completely. So those are the sort of basic key points, um, but we're going to look at a few things that uh, break down a bit. So here is one graphic. I've noticed that there are all these sorts of graphics of various degrees pretty much everywhere, wherever you go now. Um, so first step is to clean, turn on clean running water, then lather up with soap, then scrub for at least 20 seconds. Remember to scrub between your fingers, under your nails, and up your wrists. Then re rinse the soap completely off with clean running water and dry your hands completely. Of course, this doesn't take into account uh, like environmental factors in terms of like just turning your running your water on and running it for 20 seconds isn't a good idea. Don't waste your water. So like having to turn your tap on and turn your tap off while you're washing your hands, this doesn't can, like that doesn't talk about that in terms of that environmental impact of just running water. Um, and also it doesn't talk about the fact of if your water is contaminated. So most of the things that I've seen don't engage in that idea is that if your water isn't safe, then washing your hands, what do you do then? How do you do, how can you handle, how can you manage to have clean hands if your water isn't safe? So another image or another set of images that I really like um, here with soap, rub your palms of your hands together sort of gives you step by step of what to wash. So rub each palm over the back of the exposing hand with fingers interlaced. Interlace your hands and rub the palm to palm. Interlock your hands and rub the backs of your fingers into the opposing palm. And then you'd switch. Grasp your thumb and, with the opposing palm and rub while rotating. And then clasp your fingers rotating each hand onto the opposing thumb. So this just gives you sort of a what you're doing for those 20 seconds. So if you're not just rubbing them back and forth, but how you can really cover all of your hands. We're going to watch one uh, video that I liked um, about washing your hands. Again, I know this is probably repetitive, but it's still super important to make such a huge difference. watch it from the beginning, not from the end. All right, it's causing me trouble.
All right, so I always like visuals. I like to see things actually in action. So I thought that was a useful tool. Uh, just one thing to note in terms of hand sanitizer, as you know, it's something that can be concerning in some folks' homes um, is just in terms of that alcohol piece and remembering that the alcohol in hand sanitizer is completely different than alcohol in drinking alcohol, and it is incredibly dangerous to consume. So it's really important if you're going to have hand sanitizer in your home or in your environment um, to make sure that it is not accessible to anyone who might consume it. Um, it can make you go blind or it can make you, it can uh, kill you. So it's really, really important not to consume hand sanitizer, even if you attempt to separate anything or do anything. The alcohol in hand sanitizer is uh, quite poisonous to, to absorb or to ingest. So not absorb, to ingest, because you're just wiping on your hands, it dries off, um, and that doesn't going to make you sick. But if you were to ingest it, it could make you really, really sick, or could, you could lose your eyesight. So just as a sort of caveat in terms of if you're having hand sanitizer uh, around. All right, so then I have a couple more video, or not videos, uh, images of hand washing because I think that we are all guilty of uh, rinsing or not washing our hands in some moments. Um, life happens, it makes sense, it happens, but just to sort of really see what's going on uh, under a black light in terms of seeing the bacteria and the dirt that we can't see in our hands on a regular basis. So here is an image uh, before washing your hands. And so you can see that this person's hand is bright blue and has contaminants of some sort, who knows what they are, but you can see that. And then having just rinsing and shaking your hands. Um, yes, it has taken off some of the bright blue. There is less, uh, but still there's a significant amount of whatever this contaminant, whatever this dirt, these bacteria are. 
if you use do it for six seconds of so not immediately rinsing and stopping but for a little bit longer just with water you can again see that there is continues to be improvement it is better but there's still lots of contaminants on your hand six seconds with soap is even more like significant like dramatically different i feel like between the the six seconds without any soap to the six seconds with soap so soap makes a big difference and then 15 seconds again you can see even more of a difference and then 30 seconds with soap so the last three all have soap and you can really see how much of a difference it makes um particularly in the nails and knuckles areas those folds um really really make a huge difference and if you compare the before washing to the after washing with 30 seconds with soap uh, that's just incredible in terms of the difference of that coloring and the health of those hands. Uh, also, in terms of there have been much education about hand washing in the last few years, this is one thing that I saw, which I thought was pretty cool. An elementary school class, um, we're trying to figure out what actually what the importance is of washing your hands. And so they did an experiment. And so they took bread, fresh bread, and they did five different things with it. So one, the first one, they took the piece of bread and they wiped it on their Chromebooks, on their computer, and then put it in, sealed it into a bag. Then the second one, they just was the control bread. So they just took it out of the uh, package and put it directly into the, the bag and sealed it off. So it's fresh and untouched. So you see that there's no bacteria on it. Uh, third, then, the whole class touched uh, with just their regular dirty, like the regular hands, not like anything particularly dirty, but just the regular hands. They all touched a piece of bread. Then they all washed their hands with soap and water for the 20 seconds at least. And then they touched a, another piece of bread. And then finally they used hand sanitizer on their hands and they touched a fifth piece of bread. So you can see the fresh untouched bread is, looks totally fine, doesn't have any bacteria, doesn't have any mold growing on it. The bread with soap and water also doesn't have any bacteria or any mold on it really you can't really see anything the other three do have mold and bacteria growth on it the chromebooks is disgusting looking it is like so green and black the dirty hands is equally it's different it's been touched differently so it's got some places that aren't covered in mold but like it's still really covered in mold and even the hand sanitizer does have some bacteria still on it. So the hand sanitizer, as you can see, doesn't do as good of a job as just soap and water. So I thought this is a really tangible and visual way of understanding why this uh, is important, what the difference that it makes. Oh, I forgot to say that these pieces of bread were put into a bag and sealed and left for uh, one month. So this is an instant, but this is just to show you the bacteria that can grow in those environments. Okay, but it's more than just hand washing. So it isn't, it's partially is the action of rubbing your hands together with the soap and the water that breaks down your tiny bits of grease and dirt that the germs cling to. So you need to do all three. You need to have the soap, you need to have the water, you need to have the rubbing action of all of over your hands. But then you also need to disinfect your kitchen sink and your counters. You need to regularly disinfect your bathroom, including the doorknobs and the faucets, which I totally wash my faucets all the time but I never wash my doorknobs, I never think of it, but that makes complete sense. So, you know, we all have some brain fog sometimes. You also wanna regularly disinfect your desk and your computer, keyboard. Um, it's ideal to avoid eating at your desk, not necessarily always possible. Keep your hands away from your eyes, nose, and mouth. Do not share pens, cups, glasses, dishes, and cutlery at school or work. Do not pick up magazines and newspapers in doctor's office, waiting rooms, staff kitchens, or public transit generally in public areas um, and stay home if you're sick to avoid spreading germs to other people. It is best if you're sick to stay home if you can. It's do your best to stay home. If you have to leave your home, then you should wear a mask, even though masks are not 100% guarantee of not spreading germs. It is better. It is more effective to wear a mask that's going to reduce the spread of germs than not wearing a mask. So that's how we can, hand washing is so important to protecting ourselves from spreading of infectious viruses. So now let's talk about food handling safeties. This is another piece that is super important. 
So food-related illnesses and hospitalizations and deaths in Canada, here are some statistics from the Public Health Agency of Canada. So one in eight people, so that's about 4 million Canadians, get sick each year from contaminated, contaminated food. So that's a lot. 4 million people a year get sick from contaminated food. Sorry, that word's bugging me today. So that's over 11,500 hospitalizations and 240 deaths each year related to food-related illnesses. That seems wild to me. Um, the most common culprits in Canada, so this would be different in different places in the world, but in Canada for food-related illnesses are norovirus, which is a leading cause of foodborne illnesses and hospitalizations. Um, it has up to a million illnesses and 21 deaths. Listeria is uh, another leading cause of foodborne illnesses each year. So having only 178 illnesses and 150 hospitalizations, but having 35 deaths. So less illnesses and hospitalizations, but more severe and more people dying. Salmonella is uh, has 88,000 illnesses and 17 deaths. E. coli has 12 over 12,000 illnesses and eight deaths. And then Campylobacteria vector is 145,000 illnesses and five deaths. So a lot of people get sick, but not as many people die for this one. So it's just very much more common than probably many of us think um, in terms of foodborne illnesses and the impact that they have on them. So there's this four step food safety tips, which we're gonna talk about multiple times, but I'm just going to say it, the more times I say it, the easier that'll be to remember. So clean, separate, separate, cook and chill. So clean your hands, your kitchen surfaces, your utensils, utensils with warm soapy food. Separate your raw foods like meat and eggs from your cooked foods from your fruit and vegetables to avoid cross-contamination. Cook your food to safe internal temperatures using a digital food thermometer if possible and chill your food and leftovers within two hours. All right, so let's look at this a little bit more. So foodborne illnesses are what happens when a person gets sick from eating food that has been contaminated with an unwanted microorganism or pathogen. It's often called food poisoning and it's often mistaken for the stomach flu because the most common symptoms are stomach cramps, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and fever, which are also symptoms of stomach flu. However, some foodborne illnesses can cause severe symptoms and even death, like we just noticed. So it's something to take really seriously. Controlling foodborne illnesses is very difficult because a lot of our food is processed and produced in large quantities. So cross-contamination is something that happens frequently and easily because we're not just getting our food from the farmer next door, but we're getting food that's traveled long distances and gone into big factories and is exposed to very many different situations. There are federal, provincial, and municipal uh, laws and regulations for public health and food safety. There's an organization like Canada Food Inspection Agency, CFIA, and they set rules on how food is processed and sold. They also test food products for safety and warn the public if they've discovered unsafe food products. And they try to make sure that the food imported into Canada meets the Canadian requirements to make sure that people living in Canada are safe. But bacteria can survive food processing or can also become contaminated during preparation, cooking, and storage. So even if there's a bunch of regulations and safety precautions put in before you get it comes home, um, it can still be contaminated once it's home. So public health experts advise people to use safe food handling practices. So that's what we're gonna talk about the same way that uh, we talked about hand washing, which is probably fairly common practice. People know about it. Um, many of these things people are gonna know about, but it's really good to just talk about them again because they make a big difference. So this is how you buy, store, handle, and prepare your food. And again, here are the clean, separate, cook, and chill. Uh, this again, so cleaning your hands. So washing your hands with warm water and soap for 20 seconds, and then also rinsing food and fruit and veggies under running water. 
separating your raw meat, poultry, seafood, and eggs from each other and from other things, and using separate cutting boards, utensils, and plates when you are preparing food. Cooking your food to a uh, proper temperature, and that's gonna be different depending on what the food is. So cooking your poultry to 165 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 74 degrees Celsius. Cooking your ground meat to 160 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 72 degrees Celsius. And cooking your beef or pork whole or in parts to 145 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 63 degrees Celsius. Then at the end, make sure that you are chilling. So your fridge temperature should be below 400 degrees Fahrenheit or four degrees Celsius. And your freezer temp should be below zero degrees Fahrenheit or negative 17 degrees Celsius for proper, proper storage. So let's look at food storage a little bit more. So here we have a guide of a fridge and a pantry sort of storage space. So in your freezer, again, your freezer needs to be minus 17 degrees or below. So like really cold, not just freezing. Um, and you want to wrap and label your meat, your fish, your poultry, if you plan to freeze it. You don't want to just put it in straight, you need to put it in a container. And it's a good idea to label it so that you know um, what it is and when you put it in there. In your fridge, your dairy and eggs should be stored in the coldest part of the fr fridge, usually near the back and away from the door. So when you open the door, that releases the coldness, air, and that can contaminate those things. You should put your meat in the meat drawer or on the lowest shelf of the refrigerator. Again, they should be packaged or in some sort of container so as not to drip or contaminate your other food, but having it on the lowest levels means it's less likely to contaminate your other food. And using your crisper or product drawers for veggies to keep them uh, safe, though you still wanna be careful just because if you have, again, that's why you don't want raw meat to be sitting just exposed in your fridge having in a container means that you're less likely to contaminate things. Your pantry is generally between 10 degrees Celsius and 21 degrees Celsius, so room temperature. Um, and mayo and peanut butter, things like that, that are sealed can be stored in your pantry, but once they've opened, then putting them into the fridge when they're open. Canned goods can last two or more years, but it can be damaged by temperatures above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, so above like, I guess like 30, or so um, degrees so that it can be just your house getting hot in the summer can damage that food. Some like potatoes and onions and things like that, um, you wanna have them in a dark, cool part of your pantry. And if they start to go bad, remove them. This also says to keep them separate so that they don't cross contaminate. And fruits like peaches and plums, ones with pits should be placed in closed paper bag until ripe and then refrigerated and keep tomatoes in the pantry only if they're eaten within one to two days. Otherwise they go in the fridge. That's just something to keep in mind in terms of how you're storing your food. So then here's another one about talking about um, the minimum cooking temperatures in a little bit more detail. So again, we've got our clean, separate, cook and chill. You see that keeps coming up on all my slides. Um, different infographics, that different images that we're seeing, you can see that it's really important. So 165 is the minimum internal temperature for poultry. So that's including chicken, turkey, duck, and goose, all of their um, parts. Also wild game animals. So if you're hunting and you're cooking it, you wanna make sure that it's uh, 165 degrees Fahrenheit or more. Any processed ham or pre-cooked things, you wanna to to reheat it, you wanna cook it to 165. And any leftovers or casseroles, uh, again, 165 degrees Fahrenheit. Then you, things that are uh, things with ground meat or meat mixtures or egg dishes can be cooked to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Fresh beef, veal, or lamb can be to 145 degrees Fahrenheit. We will say to rest it for three minutes before testing it. So make sure that you're not testing, you're not tapping the temperature immediately after taking it out of the oven or cooking it. Fresh pork and ham also needs to be to 145 and resting for three minutes and fish with fins to 145. Then any fruits or vegetables cooked for hot holding. So like if you have it sitting somewhere in a buffet container sort of things, it should be cooked 135 degrees Fahrenheit. This is really key, the danger zone. So bacteria grows the most quickly between the temperatures of 70 degrees and 135 degrees Fahrenheit. 
70 degrees is about room temperature. So that's like sitting out on the counter until you cook it. So it's really, really important to be careful. Okay, so now we're going to watch a video about food safety. All right, so hopefully many of those things are logical and make sense and are manageable to do. So now you can do the key questions on page 98 for check your understanding questions one and two. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about indoor air quality. So we've talked a lot about air pollution, but we've been focusing on outdoor air pollution. And on average, there are two to five times more pollutants indoors than outdoors. And so that with Canadians spending 90% of their time indoors and there being more pollution indoors, this is resulting in uh, impact on our health. So one in 10 Canadians have asthma. So that's 3.5 million people. And one in six Canadians suffer from allergenic redness due to allergens. So that's 6.3 million people have uh, allergies that are impacted by the quality of our air. So indoor air pollutants can be biological. So this is like mold, bacteria, dust mites that are in our environments, or they can be chemical. So volatile organic compounds, VOCs, which we talked about before. So in our household products, you can react to, um, but also gases and particles from fuel burning appliances, from tobacco smoke, from building materials, and also from outdoor air coming indoors. So now we're gonna watch another, our last video, uh, just about the five um, air, indoor air quality categories and the impacts. Let's see if it's gonna work for me. Take that as a no. It's not gonna stop. Here we go. 
when it comes to assessing a family this then we're looking at violent protection agency identified five indoor air quality categories of concern in all families and potential for the It stops abruptly. I'm not quite sure why. But anyway, that gives us some information about the types of contaminants that are in our air that we need to be concerned about. So how do we improve our indoor air quality? So there's three different methods. The first is source control. So this is preventing pollutants from getting into the air. So avoid smoking indoors is super important. Uh, regularly dust and vacuum your home. Keep your home dry, so using a de dehumidifier and fixing anything that causes dampness. Make sure your fuel burning appliances are well maintained and working properly. Avoid idling cars or lawnmowers in attached garages. And reduce off-gassing of household materials and products by choosing ones that contain fewer VOCs. Second method is ventilation to control. So increase movement of outdoor air to the indoors, which decreases stale air and reduces indoor pollutants and moisture. So open your windows and your doors when you can. Turn on kitchen and bathroom fans. Install mechanical heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, HVACs, that can bring in outdoor air, vent stale air, and circulate air, and control temperatures and humidity. 
And then the third one is air cleaning. So this is designed to remove impurities from the air. Some are good at removing particles, but most are not very good at removing gases. So it's not as effective as uh, source control or ventilation. Air cleaner filters the air, while air purifiers sanitize the air by emitting negative ions, ozone, and utilizing heat um, with UV or UVC lamps. So air cleaning and air purifying is sort of the last line of defense, um, but source control and ventilation are the better bets. All right, so that is our lesson today. So this has been lesson 12, personal, personal hygiene and household cleaners. So a reminder that we talked about hand washing where you need to do it first with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, focusing between your fingers, under your nails, and the front, back, and wrists of your hands. Talk about food safety and how there are over 11,500 hospitalizations and 240 deaths per year. So there's something to really be concerned about and how the importance of having of the clean, separate cook and chill. So clean your workspace and your hands, separate your food in terms of, so it's not cross-contaminated, so raw uh, meat and poultry and eggs, separate that from your any cooked food or fruit and vegetables. Uh, cook your food to a uh, proper internal temperature. So look that up, use a digital thermometer to properly do that. And then chill your food immediately um, or within two hours of either cooking or bring home to store. And then finally, we talked about indoor air quality and how there are both biological and chemical factors to consider. And the best prevention methods are source control and ventilation with air cleaning and air purifying um, as sort of an added component, but source control and ventilation being your better bets. So hopefully we, you can meet our success criteria so that you can practice proper hand washing techniques. If we were in a classroom, I would make you actually practice, but we're not, so you can do that on your own time. Uh, two, you can explain how safely handling food, how to do it by implementing clean, separate, cook, and chill. And three, you know the dangers of disregarding indoor air quality. And so now you know the methods of prevention to help the, hopefully that you can minimize the effects. At this point, you can do the review questions on page 101, questions one through 13. If you have any questions or concerns, as always, please reach out. Now that we are halfway through our course, it's really, really important that you connect with me in order to send me work and make sure you're on track if you're hoping to finish the credit this year. If you don't finish the credit by June 10th, um, if you next year, that means that you're gonna have to start over again from the beginning. Um, so just keep that in mind that that's fine. You can start, you can keep your work and start again next year. That's totally reasonable, but something to consider and you wanna practically choose that opposed to uh, running out of time. So if you wanna reach out to me and we can talk about it, my number is 807-737-1488, extension 2209. You can also call toll free at 1-800-667-3703. You can email me at bronwyn.slate, which is spelled B-R-O-N-W-Y-N dot S-L-A-T-E at nnec.on.ca. You can connect with me through Facebook at bslatewasa and our class, our Recording of this class will be uploaded to YouTube at B Slate Wasa uh, in the next 24 hours or so. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have a lovely day and uh, miigwech.